and creative sectors. And in the morning, we had a, a great uh, discussion on the public side of things, so on how the public sector, uh, the government budgets, both national, local, and well, super national in the case of the European Commission, uh, supported the creative sectors through the crisis, and what are the longer term trends um, and issues uh, there. And uh, of course, we all know that the supports were massive and un unprecedented through the uh, crisis over the past, well, <laughs> soon almost two years. Um, and these supports will continue in the recovery, and many um, countries are allocating uh, close to 2%, sometimes even more, through their recovery funds uh, here in, in Europe. And the Commission continues to support massively the sectors, and we'll hear more from uh, Barbara Stacher, who is with us uh, today on this. Um, so that was a very good uh, discussion. We also touched upon the trends in the philanthropy funding for cultural sectors and some heard some perspectives from the museum and music sector in, in particular um, as well. Um, this session is uh, more about uh, investment, well, private investment, also public investment in the more market oriented creative sectors. So let's uh, start and uh, I'm sure people will continue to join uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Pierluigi Sacco, who is a senior advisor to the OECD on culture and previously as well uh, advisor to the European Commissioner for the European uh, Year of Cultural Heritage. Uh, Pierluigi, very happy to have you with us and uh, uh, I give you the mic, I give you the screen, the, the floor, <laughs> the floor uh -huh. is yours. Please, Pierluigi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katia. I'm really happy to have a chance to moderate uh, such an important, relevant discussion, and I must say, with a really relevant roster of speakers. So we will start our session with uh, an introduction by, uh, already, as already anticipated by Katia, by Barbara Stacher, so Senior Expert in the Cultural Policy Unit of the Director General for Education, Youth, Sports and Culture of the European Commission. So Barbara, the floor is, floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Welcome. I will share my screen. One second. Can you see everything? Yes. Oh. One second. Yes. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, just I will focus a bit on what the European Union does at EU level for supporting cultural and creative sectors and industries. Just to start with the framework, which is the Council Work Plan for Culture. And uh, there, it, a reference is made to an ecosystem supporting artists, cultural and creative professionals, and European content. And uh, well, in general, just to say that uh, different EU policy support actions are given towards cultural and creative sectors and industries. Uh, a new initiative that we are working with Gerin, who is here in this panel also, is the EU Pact for Skills for Cultural and Creative Sectors and Industries, uh, together with also other important um, networks and, and uh, industries in, in this field. Then another topic is working conditions for artists and cultural and creative professionals, also the freelancers, to cover also the side of the of precarity and uh, European social pillar and uh, what can be done. Then copyright fair remuneration. You have seen that today uh, and yesterday the European Parliament is, is uh, discussing this um, legislation and will be now negotiated with the Council. So that will be very important also with uh, platform legislations. Then a big, an important part of our work is also evidence-based policies. So work with Eurostat, there's an ongoing measuring cultural and creative sectors and industries study uh, also goes again to the definitions and to find more granularity. And then of course, there's much more. There's a lot of uh, other topics, cultural heritage, gender inclusion, green, international, new European Bauhaus. So uh, <laughs> there are many topics. But here, what is probably most relevant, I wanted to, for the ones who have not participated in that stock taking conference that was two years ago, just before the lockdowns, uh, you know, member states and culture and creative sectors and projects getting together, brainstorming, what is actually, what has been achieved in 
access to finance for cultural and creative sectors and innovation, what has been achieved and what is still to be done. And if you click on that link, you can find a lot of, it's a huge to-do list, which resulted in lots of different, um, yeah, you know, working stock taking sessions, everybody, all the heads were, you know, uh, were very working at high speed. So you can find a lot of ideas in that uh, link. Then uh, during the crisis, there was also a, a joint initiatives of the sectors and the commission uh, to create a platform, Creatives Unite, actually, to, um, you can also contribute. So you see the, the right bottom here, contribute. You can actually also put your own initiative in there and link up to uh, other um, people. And you can also browse by sector and uh, there's a lot of opportunities there also. So that's quite an interesting tool which can be used by everyone. Then on, at EU level, how do we, I mean, there are different support programs, grants and uh, especially grants. So there is uh, Creative Europe, of course, Erasmus, EU structural funds, Katya mentioned already the uh, ERFF, the um, uh, resilience facility, then Horizon, invest EU, so the different EU programs which tackle different angles of need. So, you know, some of them are more entrepreneurial, some of them more towards artists, some more on youth exchange. So uh, you can find different uh, possibilities here. It's not only for EU countries, but for countries who signed up to these programs. And the KIC, a knowledge and innovation communities, there will be a new one for cultural and creative uh, industries, sectors and industries actually, Many people are preparing um, applications. The call is open until March, 2022. Of course, it's not for individual applications, but this needs to be a very large consortium and uh, a lot of money involved and will be an interesting boost to cultural and creative sectors and industries. Well, how to find EU funding concretely in all these uh, different uh, programs, how to find your way. Just a month ago, we issued an EU funding tool for cultural and creative sectors. So you can uh, find, if you click on this link, you can search by sector, by need. So that's a new tool. And yes, thank you. I'm welcome. And you can ask me questions and whatever you need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this uh short but co comprehensive uh, uh, overview of the many the many opportunities and programs that are today at our disposal i would say that uh, that's probably an unprecedented moment in terms of abundance and variety of funding lines from the european uh, union and this is really a very very welcome uh, news in a moment like this so at this point uh, we are uh, ready for uh, the second presentation already anticipated by Barbara, but Gerin Trautenberger, president of Creative Wirtschaft Austria and uh, Austria at the same time, also a member of the European Creative Business Network. And uh, we will uh, at this point uh, in particular uh, tackle uh, the issue of uh, uh, recovery funds, venture capital for culture and creative industries. Uh, and uh, so what, what is the panorama of opportunities from the point of view of the creative entrepreneurship side? So Gary, the floor is yours. Uh, so, um, so thank you, Pierre, Lu uh, Luigi, uh, for, for int introducing me and giving us the opportunity to talk. I mean, I'm Gerin Trautenberger. I've, in my profession, I'm a designer myself, and I'm representing the Creative Future of Austria. I'm the elected president. It's the Chambers of Commerce in Austria. And uh, with this, I'm also part in the executive board of the European uh, Creative Business Network, which is an uh, interest organization across over Europe. Um, uh, if you if you allow me to show my slides, am, am I already up to? Yes. Okay, great. Absolutely. So we prepared some few uh, numbers for you. Uh, I'm replacing uh, Bernd Fesel. Unfortunately, he's uh, just got a short call, so he asked me to step in. But anyways, I hope I can satisfy you uh, also like, like Bernd. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we have a short um, 
we, uh, we have a little research on, on the financing side of creative industries, and especially about the private financing besides the, the state and, and, and grants and, and so on. So um, what we can, what we see is, I mean, if we talk about numbers, I don't know if, if everybody's family, but I will re uh, repeat it. Uh, we, we, Europe has 1.8 million entrepreneurs. Uh, we generate around 500 billion cross added value. And uh, this corresponds to 5% of the EU uh, GDP, so to say. And uh, we, uh, the, our sector employs over 12 million people. So that's, that's, that's a huge number, I would say. Uh, as much as we contribute 4% uh, uh, to the European GDP, uh, our sector only receives around 1% of the recovery fund. So there is already a huge mismatch on, on, on this side. So I, I think, I mean, this will be uh, in for future debates that we demand a little bit uh, bigger share on the on the recovery fund. But what we can see, what we can see in, in our studies that uh, around 500,000 founders a year. So it, 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 they are coming directly from the university or in their second, uh, second career, they start a new business because they were former employed, but then start again. And uh, when, you, when you calculate all these numbers together, it means that there are 30 to 40 billion euros in private investment and public funding together per year is generated within the creative industries. I mean, we see this, this, to me at least, are quite impressive numbers, uh, but uh, uh, the, financing for the financing side of companies is quite untapped. And I mean, of course, uh, because of our diversity in our sector, uh, each of the own branches has uh, different uh, uh, reasons why it's better financed or, or lesser financed. So it, 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 which market is more mature and which market is less mature. I don't want to go into details with that. Uh, but we see uh, a trend and uh, this is quite, quite um, important. We see a trend in scaling up uh, uh, dis uh, disruptive models uh, globally. And uh, of course, and you all heard this uh, about these unicorns from Euro uh, Europe, uh, like Spotify, Georgigam, uh, Contentful, Depop, uh, Vestair, Collective, Vinted, Hopin, Homes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, there they are there are really good, interesting projects out there, which are you know uh, coming from uh, every year you know on the market, and and all, all also make make it uh, globally, so to say. Uh, how we can break it down into a few sectors, I mean, which we found, you know, so I mean, the event tech, uh, there is 1 billion uh, investments in fashion, there's around 3 billion investments in the gaming sector, one of the upcoming and striving sectors, uh, nearly six, uh, six billions. The marketing, of course, 11 billions, media around 8 billions and music um, around uh, 600 um, uh, uh, the 1.6 billion uh, euros. So in total, that's why we come up with 30 billions of, of investments in the CCI sector. Just in comparative, uh, the health sector in total has 82 billion, fintech uh, 42 billion, and transport 42 billion. So we see there is a somehow there is a room for 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 improvement, the room for development, and I think uh, this is what we see. We really see the coming years that there will be much more uh, money invested in 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 our sector, so to say, because uh, we see their interesting projects coming. We see interesting people, you know, from the university every year coming on the market, new ideas approaching, uh, and and uh, we are quite hopeful uh, that it will it will grow this number. So what are the hidden opportunities? So uh, we see that the CCI has a above market, above average growth, so to say, uh, on the market. Uh, and now we represent 4.4% uh, uh, of the European GDP. Uh, and I mean, this is the numbers are pre-COVID, so to say. Of course, there's a drop with COVID, but since, the, uh, since, the, since all the ec economies are dropping, uh, dropped in the last two years, I will see also a drop uh, for, for the CCIs. But however, uh, still 
today it's not considered to be to really attractive our sector for most of the equity funds and investors out there. Uh, so we have to we have to change the perception of our sector for for the equity uh, uh, investors, so to say. Uh, what we see and and. and uh, private equity and venture capital is only one stepping stone for financing. Of course, we have uh, huge potential in, in angel investors, micro lenders, very interesting uh, model, especially because of the, of the structure of this, of the creative industries. I mean, we have to see that out of these 1.2 billion uh, million uh, entrepreneurs, uh, we have 99% of them are single or micro entrepreneurs. So of course, then it would correspond an interesting model to, uh, to establish a better micro lending uh, uh, um, instrument. Debt financing, bank loans can cover any range of financing requirements. We see that uh, the banks are uh, not equipped and not, uh, how I say, do not understand the necessity and the specificity of our sector. So uh, most of, of our sector, you know, if you go to the bank, they say, no, you're not, you're not worth it, you're not credit, credible. So you have to take a private loan, so to say, to start your business. So this is also something we have to teach the, the bank in the finance sector, how our, our, um, our sector is working. Philanthropic funding, of course, has to be uh, uh, developed further and crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is actually an instrument coming from the creative industries and established that very well. But of course, uh, you can uh, you have room for improvement, so to say. So basic that's uh, basically that's my my input and uh, thank you. And I'm I'm here for questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Gary. And I think that uh, this is really interesting picture being drawn out because uh, it's it's true, as you correctly point out, that there is still a gap to be filled with respect to the major investor areas. But at the same time, there is also a very clear catching up trend because uh, a few years ago it would have been unthinkable. <laughs> think of the cultural and creative sector so as sectors that could credibly compete with fintech or with health. Today, yeah. it's becoming a realistic perspective. And this really means that we are on the right track, but we need to make uh, the next steps. And uh, this is exactly what we are uh, up uh, to reflecting about today. And uh, I have a fantastic panel that, I, that I'm going to introduce you uh, about this, uh, including, of course, Gary himself. Uh, and uh, in addition to getting, we will have uh, Oliver Schulbaum, who's a co-founder, president, and head of research and development at Platonic in Barcelona and, and uh, Mallorca, and the vice chair of the European Crowdfunding Network. Then we have uh, Vincent Favra, who's an entrepreneur and business angel and founder of Scale Up Factory. Uh, we will have uh, Fabio Viola, who is a renowned game designer and producer, and uh, we will also be later joined by Josephine Hage, who's the deputy director of Creative Saxony. Uh, okay, so we have uh, an absolutely competent roster to ask the first difficult question, which is, uh, what are the lessons learned from this crisis? How has this uh, current crisis changed the financial landscape and the availability of funding for market-oriented creative sectors? We have the privilege of having people from different backgrounds that can really illuminate us uh, in terms also of a sectoral perspective. We will uh, go deeper into the sectoral perspectives in the next step, but uh, it's uh, first of all, very interesting to collect their own, uh, their own perceptions and impressions in terms of what is the general trend for financial ability. So I would start from Olivier. Yeah, hello, thanks for having me. So if you allow me, I prepared a statement uh, since we you, you shared the questions uh, before, thanks for that. So I'd like to share a couple of, uh, of uh, pictures. So if you can allow me to share the screen, yes, that would be good since I'm a very visual guy. So I'll be talking less about numbers, although we got the numbers, uh, and more about value and impact of culture, right? Uh, so just confirm you can hear me correctly and you see my screen. Uh, okay. Um, so I'll be talking about um, Beyond Money, which is the title, right? So uh, basically, I, I want you to um, think about what has been talked also this morning in the first panel. Think about that uh, all these numbers we have seen that Gavin has shared with us. Imagine an exercise where we look at the uh, outputs of these uh, uh, you know, these industries or these uh, social entrepreneurs working on creating culture. In a few years, 
beyond us. So in 25 years, what will be left of this unicorn? So what will be the future heritage, right? So I'd like to look at crowdfunding as an opportunity of creating a new culture around producing culture, producing creativity, sharing creativity. And my questions to you is, and I think it's very uh, resonating with uh, Pierre Luigi's work on culture 3.0 models. So how can crowdfunding clearly be the one tool that can help bring our cultural heritage out of the closed controlled spaces of state protection and private patronage. So that's basically where the crowd factor is intervening the most. So, you know, we're living exciting times. So both the pandemic mixed with uh, pro pro protests all over the world. So you see, we're talking about the future heritage. So, uh, so the, what are the uh, piece of heritage we're building now? So we know, uh, you know, the, the, the previous models of producing cultures are very irrelevant today. So we see all these protesters all over the world tearing down racist monuments all over the world. Native activists pulling down Christopher Columbus statue and state capital, right? So that is happening. That is the crowd. How the crowd is reacting to uh, how we produced culture uh, uh, before, right? Fun enough, the, the first exa documented example of Crowdfunding is how the Statue of Liberty has been basically uh, supported or crowdfunded uh, by citizens. So you see, it's a very interesting thing that all the uh, scheme of crowdfunding, which is based on identifying rewards and uh, creating new relationship uh, with the public. In that case, everything was documented. So you had, a, you had exactly a, a clear contract on what you get if you uh, for one dollar or for five dollars. So that's happening on, on on digital platforms right now, and a very nice documentation on the right. So that. The crowdfunding is not new. It's just about this, this uh, specific moment today where the scenario is, can we ensure that the heritage of tomorrow will be financed and curated, not only with, but also by the crowd. That means we need to rethink our, our production mode. So I think it's a message also to the creative industries. Uh, if, you, if you use crowdfunding, you're using the crowd. That means that you need to think about what are the crowd, the benefits for the crowd, not only uh, individual benefits for the project who get support. So playing around with uh, jumps into the history, what basically is happening, what is the cosmology in, a, in, in, in the crowdfunding platforms? If we think about the great crowd cross function platform, and coming back to, to the ancient Greek uh, theaters uh, and Italian in that case. So it's another message for <laughs> uh, for the Italians in the room. So uh, we see the platform just as a, a, that type of a building where the crowd is basically having a great role. So we have the landing page, which could be an equivalent of the stage. Then we have uh, uh, what we call, it's very important to call about training. We've mentioned that. I think training is more important than funding most of the time. And, and the new types of funding needs the new types of uh, capacity building, it's important to mention, none of, none of this will work the, uh, if people are not prepared to it. So both creators and citizens, they, they need to know that, uh, that their potential impact on founding a new culture. So I think that's very important. The next step, of course, we need to think about all the documentation, the sharing, uh, creative commons culture. So we need to make sure that all the projects and creators using the crowd must uh, you know, uh, return uh, in, in the sense of uh, solidarity and learnings to others and to the next generation. I think it's important to mention, we need to have data. So what the, the big, I mean, we are a big fan of data, we'll not mention numbers, but I think if we don't have data, uh, I think that would be impossible to measure. All right, so the impact needs to be totally open and we need to let academics make them work, but we need to prepare the, you know, if a, a platform is a, is a non fide error, we need to have a specific doors for data for uh, both the commission, policymakers and academics uh, to build up like their own hypothesis and their own conclusion with these new phenomena happening around, right? And the crowd is of course the main uh, actor and we'd have, we'd have to think about crowdfunding as the first step to a long learning curve, so probably, uh, in that sense, reward crowdfunding and donation crowdfunding is the basic steps we need to make sure that uh, initiatives can grow and, and jump into the next level that would be crowd equity. So, uh, you know, the alternative financing is a quite complex issue. So, but we, we, we don't have to look at uh, these new types of uh, production, production only through the lens of crowdfunding. You, we, we have to consider alternative finance, social impact loans, micro loans, digital finance, online payments, crypto, crypto uh, money, et cetera, right? Uh, and I'm um, quickly, uh, you know, if stru structurally it's important to, to divide uh, crowdfunding opportunities into different modes. 
of uh, financing. So donation-based and rewards-based, which I'm representing as part of the uh, European crowdfunding network, uh, is the first step to jump to equity-based and probably lending-based, which I've been mentioned before. Uh, just my, my last alert, I think it's very important, to, and it's another message for the creative industries, thinking about the future heritage of tomorrow, is we need to clearly look at the risk behind crowdfunding, especially uh, what is the limit between crowdfunding and what I call pre-selling or crowd capitalism. So the crowd factor should basically change our relationship with the modes of production and the modes of uh, opening up culture. So uh, people financing a, a project, if I'm a creator, should be able to take some decisions on the, on, on down, the, down the line and probably at the end, uh, we could financers, uh, um, uh, public uh, uh, public funds uh, and and citizens create cooperatives of you know new types of production of culture. I think we need to avoid all these scams on the on the on the crowdfunding platforms, which is happening. So I think it's important to mention. So heritage culture is not a gadget. Heritage, in that sense, is not a product. Heritage is a commons, and we need to make sure that crowdfunding implies looking at the other side of the chain benefits for the crowd. So it's not about sending my book. Uh, so crowdfunding is not a new type of Amazon, which is basically about asking ourselves, can we, do we have capacity right now to create cooperative culture, uh, which is really bridging us uh, to making sure that, um, that uh, public funds are combined with crowdfunding. I think that's my last message for today. Match funding is the key uh, to the uh, potential sustainability of all the systems. So we need to make sure that citizens see their money being doubled, tripled by uh, public money funds. I think it's very on the region, on a uh, region scale, on the city scale. Uh, national scale is more is more complicated to relate to for a citizen, right? So I think it's very important that that's my last uh, uh, message to to you. And 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 I guess uh, uh, we we're gonna share the slides anyway. So uh, I'll I'll be also sharing uh, lots of reports from the ECN. On, uh, on also identifying the interest of the European Commission on combining match funding, crowdfunding, uh, and, and ECF funds, social innovation funds. I think it's that, that's the future. And that's basically where I see the, uh, mostly the trends in, in creating value and talking less about money. Thanks. And sorry for hijacking the format. No, no, no. Olivier, thanks to you. I mean, that was uh, impressive in, sense, in the sense of really giving us uh, a, a perception of, of, of the real potential. And I could, of course, agree more on the idea of entrusting uh, communities from this point of view, not just as, uh, let's say, passive receivers, but really, in some sense, as co-agents of this process. And uh, this is a shift that it's uh, easily set, but not so easily done, as we have seen, by the way, ourselves in the uh, indices uh, uh, Horizon uh, Europe, Pro uh, Horizon 2020 actually project that we are uh, developing together in which this, uh, this gap, this basic gap between the possibilities and the actual agency is still very wide. And uh, that's the point. And now we need uh, also to redirect new types of, uh, of, uh, of action in terms of empowerment, in terms of uh, active capability building that is probably the key also into transforming crowdfunding itself into an expressive and not simply instrumental uh, operation. Because of course, people in some sense uh, feel uh, the need to be co-producers of things they believe in. And that that's where uh, we will probably have to make uh, the real change for the next few years. Thank you, very, very inspiring. And uh, at this point, I would like to ask uh, Vincent Favra, what's your take Vincent, on, uh, on the issue of the main lessons learned from the crisis? Many thanks um, for, for, for the introduction and the, the thoughtful uh, exchanges. I think uh, I will also share some, some slides if you allow me to. Uh, I have the impression that uh, the, the crisis have changed many things. <laughs> and, and among these things, I think there are some global trends that, that appear. First, there is the, the creator's economy has been uh, empowered in the sense that uh, the, the production tools and, and uh, notably production tools powered by technologies are becoming less and less expensive. So we, we, we see a, um, a strong demand from uh, millions of content creators and artists and creative uh, people to, um, to basically take the market or to, to propose something in the market. Then I think there is a strong demand for unexploited digital content from, from global audiences. So we see a globalization trend on this. 
And then there is the direct consumer revolution that accelerated with the COVID. And, uh, and I think this is part of the mobile uh, revolution where we see that, uh, you know, that creates these three uh, trends create a momentum around the creative technologies. And I think this is a moment to, to kind of capture. Uh, if, if I take a step back and I see how, uh, you know, uh, the companies have emerged in the sectors, I take here gaming, video, photo, audio, life culture, and edu education, entertainment uh, as categories. Uh, during the last 15 years, we see that across all of the many categories of the of the value value chain, uh, companies have emer emerged and became giants. And many of them, uh, in this case, of about eighty percent of the companies written on, on this in these slides, uh, are coming from Europe. So Europe has, is a sweet spot in terms of generating game changers and leaders across the value chain. Uh, but there is an acceleration now um, between 2020 and 2025 where uh, opportunities are to be taken, let's say. Um, I think, you know, I would like to stress this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, analogy with the, maybe with mobile gaming. Uh, in 10 years time, mobile gaming has become a 100 billion uh, market and uh, people have developed really data-driven approach in these markets. And um, I think there, is, uh, there are many opportunities of uh, similar B2C, so business to cost consumer uh, businesses across the different cultural and, and creative industries. And this is a, a way for me, um, for Europe to create uh, champions, so to speak. One other very important aspect in, uh, in the financing from my point of view is, uh, is what happened with growth funding. Uh, we were complaining uh, along the years that Europe was not able to generate uh, mega rounds of financing, 50 million, 100 million plus, and this has shifted in the last years. So here I take the example of gaming uh, where VC and m and is, uh, is strong with, uh, you know, on average, 150 financing per year, um, a lot of trade sales, so IPOs and, and exits, and a uh, strong public market. And you know, on the other side, we see outside of gaming, um, other sectors inside of the creative industries where you see a lot of rounds that are exceeding 10 million. So 185 rounds. And you know, Europe is a fair share of that. It's more than one, one, one fourth, so one quarter of this, uh, with average sizes of round that are uh, around 50 million. So things have changed a bit in this, in this sense. There is big money from big players coming. And I think it's something to take into account. And the last thing that I would like to say about the you know, um, creative uh, tech as uh, an asset class for venture capital is that actually it's outperforming. Uh, the other VC categories. We are used to think of medtech, of biotech, of fintech, or whatever sectors as, as uh, very serious investment uh, sectors. But if you look at the sector that brought the most revenue to venture capital in Europe in the last uh, six to seven years, it's creative technologies. So you see on the graph here from 7 billion to 60 billion, it's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous factor. Like the nine that is, is being done. And this is very uh, significant. That's explaining why you have these giants, uh, Spotify, King, Belief, that just IPO'd on the French, uh, uh, Oronex, Minecraft, Unity, Supercell. You know, I just put a, a few of the European champions here, but it's meaning that Europe is able to create leaders, is able to create unicorns, and might size the opportunity to take to, 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 to welcome uh, uh, world leaders in this field with sectors where it leads. Music tech has been one, mobile gaming has been one, and there are many sectors that we could consolidate to basically size the opportunity. Yeah, that was in a nutshell what I could say about the subject. Thank you very much, Vincent, extremely interesting. By the way, uh, this is a very, very uh, solid way to 
counter the usual narrative that uh, in some sense the momentum is shifting towards the Pacific as if this is just uh, an inevitable tendency and uh, the creative uh, production trends would follow up in this regard. Uh, I think that uh, Europe, I mean, has, has built up uh, an impressive potential for uh, not simply for, for creative production, but also for the social basis, let's say, of collective creation that now are probably starting to pay off. But uh, it's, it's, it's important to bring this uh, not simply to the attention of the public opinion, but the policymakers, because still, still there is a tendency to, of course, to oversee uh, this potential. Although now with the launch of the kick, of course, at least at the European level, it's clear that this is becoming one of the key pillars for European development in the next few years, at last. So thank you very much for this really, really energizing and insightful perspective. And by the way, also uh, with the, for the, create, the, the, the very concrete data that you provided to us. And since we spoke already a lot about gaming, at this point, I would like to give the floor to Fabio Viola, who's uh, one of the most uh, dynamic and uh, visionary game designers and producers today on the European scene. Fabio, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks for inviting me here. I'm going to share the screen too. And I mean, you know, video games are always been a private funded kind of industries, let's say, um, based on audience centers kind of economies. And I want to share with you something happened, especially during the last two years in the pandemic, uh, in the pandemic era. I mean, we are, we are moving towards the, the classical business model it has been historically the pay to play it's almost similar to any physical environment out, out of there like museums or like consumer goods you have to pay something in advance in order to obtain that object that experience that process etc etc for the video games has been the same you go to the shops and you get back the packaging after having paid 60 euro 50 i don't know mm. Moving, uh, moving from the physical environment to the digital kind of environment, but let's say di digitalization, I'll explain it, it later. We move to the free-to-play economies. It's something happened inside the video games and the, the other worlds are not coming in already. For free-to-play, I mean, we are, we are giving for free our games. It seems strange, but something from an economical perspective happens inside the gameplay. And actually 70% of our industry around $180 billion yearly comes from free to play kind of experiences. And they are pretty much related to the usage and to the engagement. But in the last two years during the pandemic, something interesting happened and we are experiencing and pivoting a new model, a completely new business model. What we call play to earn, it's, it's inside new kind of games that are related to the metaverse native environment. So people are playing and earning money and we have hundred millions of players and people that are earning money and converting their own economy from ex former taxi drivers in Philippines are relocating themselves as gamers inside this these virtual worlds. And it's I think it's pretty much interesting what is happening because it's following um, a shift from the idea of spectator to an idea to spectator. No, this shift from the idea of passive and contemplative viewer to an active and proactive role is at the heart of these new engagement processes. And spectators are leading the free to play environments. Instead, what I call spectator are leading this play to earn new kind of environments. And trying to do, and, and closing my uh, initial talk, uh, some parallelism with what is happening in culture, for example, our museum are pretty much close to the premium games or pay in advance model, no? Few customers, I mean, high price point, upfront purchase, high emotional investment are mm, big structures with great collection, amazing artworks, and customer expect innovation, longevity, originality, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, a large part, for example, of our museum are small and medium 
the same for the companies and probably free to play business model are more relevant for them because there is low price point or free or free there are in a purchase leg uh, tightly connected with engagement models and and of course you you need a different approach, a different governance, because users need to come back to come back. So we need short additive gameplay session, highly polished visuals. And I think it's pretty much uh, important to consider that we are entering, especially thanks to the pandemic, definitely in the creative based economy or creator era. And right now, we are moving from a culture produced from many to many to a, uh, from culture produced from by few to many to many to many. So a mass democratization right now. And this is what's happening inside video games and probably something related is happening even outside the video games industry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Well, I think that uh, we, we, we clearly see that we are in the middle of uh, what it's uh, commonly called a disruptive wave of change. But so from this point of view, of course, uh, one, uh, one of the aspects that then emerge is, uh, okay, but this uh, incredible growth from the point of view of production, how this relates to uh, aspects that are uh, increasingly becoming relevant today uh, like, uh, for example, uh, social impact investing. But before, before going to this, and I'm saying this to, to make our uh, panelists to prepare uh, for, uh, let's say, the next round of questions, I would like also to ask uh, Gary if he has uh, something to add on this first uh, round of uh, comments on the, the pan post-pandemic scenario. Mm -hmm. Gary. Yeah, no. Uh, uh... I have to agree to all of, of you, of course. Um, uh, it was strange to have another opinion on that. But we see, we see that the gaming sector is growing and growing and growing. I mean, I, 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 what I can see from the Austrian numbers, since 2015, the gaming and software sector became the biggest sector within the creative industries. And we see a huge potential. We have, we have companies in Austria who are 100% export oriented. So they have no, no, in, no, no inner market, uh, uh, inner market uh, activities that have only export market activities. So you see there's a totally shift in, 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 in the sense of, of where is it going and how it is going. And, um, uh, and uh, there, there's this potential. And uh, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, we have to focus in the, in the future how we can integrate the gaming sector more into the uh, contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, discussions within our, uh, our industries, because uh, the gaming sector, and I think Fabio uh, referred to that, it, it's a little bit outside, so to say, it's not included in the, in the, in the dialogue, so to say, and we have to, you know, step, step towards the, the gaming sector for that. May I Thank may you. I ask a question? Sure. Sorry, uh, Pierluigi, because I mean uh, to Gerin and, and Fabio specifically. Uh, so just to want to let you know that uh, uh, I talked about match funding. So this uh, uh, co uh, hybrid uh, funding scheme where we have the, the citizens on one side uh, that are defining the criteria or where the money should go, and then public public entities are just uh, doubling. Uh, so if it's a question of trust. Uh, so we're working on a funding scheme for social video games. So uh, just to let you know, so we're starting a, a conversation. I think it's important. Uh, but at the end of the chain, we have a three years program of creating these uh, video games with, uh, uh, together with a, uh, an association called Ars Games. Uh, I think it's important. I'd like to ask Fabio if he knows about, uh, you know, these aspects of, uh, you know, more uh, educative uh, video games. So, but on the, at the end of the chain, behind these funding schemes, uh, the city council, which is the other actor uh, in, in this triangle, is also very interested in the model of creating a public, a public publisher of uh, social uh, video games. So I, I don't know if you know any, which I think it's a great model. And I know I, I was wondering if you know any uh, models like this uh, in Europe, because I know that in the United States there's a couple. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting model. Uh, also on the issues of, uh, you know, integration, cohesion, uh, policy making. So can we see vid the video game and like the social aspects of video game 
especially if they're designed for that purpose, uh, as kind of a guarantee that we have social cohesion and we have dialogues through gaming, for example. So I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, but I think I'd like to have your, your feedback on that. Yeah, 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 I think it's an amazing crossover. And there are, fortunately, in the last year, several examples, even leading by municipalities. We have a project right now in place here in Italy. It's called Alghero Playable City. And they are investing around 1 million euro in infrastructuring uh, with games, but may for games, I mean physical and digital with social purpose, the whole city. So, um, so video games as creative tool, as social tool. And for example, this year we had the all time records in entrance in the museums because all the museums are being uh, uh, retold through the games and they made plus 80%. So they are recovering the budget they invested. The budget comes from an European funded project. It's any any med or something like that. I mean, it's uh, inter-European something like that. So yeah, we have a sample, but I think the great challenge is how to combine the social, the educational um, perspective with the engagement one. Otherwise we create amazing the, that um, learning tools, for example, but nobody's going to use that. And they are not gonna be so self-sustainable in the medium long term. In, instead, Minecraft or Assassin's Creed that as bo are born as engagement tools, they became one of the best learning tools, for mm. example, inside the schools. Uh, yeah, I, actually, well, it's just, just uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I think uh, the example you gave is, is very interesting. And I think Minecraft has been also tested as a, as a, you know, for example, in the school of my own, uh, my, my sister, they're using it to create, uh, you know, the, uh, the rules of the uh, school, uh, school, the room, uh, the classroom. Uh, so building some, you know, like, you know, educating on, on, you know, how can we use gaming into uh, creating social constructions, which you could also, also easily combine with uh, art history, looking at, Joseph is talking about social sculpture, which is basically what we obtain when we found projects on a crowdfunding platform. So I think it's very relevant, very nice metaphor. Thank you. And I'll, I'll get in touch with you, of course. Maybe if, if I may, I think there is a, a con competitive gap in, in Europe, in my eyes, uh, when it comes to uh, ed tech, edutainment, and so on. Uh, the numbers of, of unicorns in the tech sector exploded, uh, but they exploded in India, they exploded in uh, China, they exploded in, uh, in the US. In Europe, we have Kahoot, we have uh, you know, huge fundraise like 360 Learning just raised 200 million, for example, but it's, it's, it's a competition. So if we don't put the food chain from crowdfunding, crowd equity to uh, you know, the most difficult pre-service A yes. type of, of investment, so seed pre-service A, and then the VC game, service A, service B, and growth funding afterwards, if we let our champions, in, at, you know, alone at the, in, in the middle of the way, it won't help because they will go to the US or, or do other type of schemes afterwards. So I think it's really important to have the old gene of that to, and I think also towards gaming, there is a, a kind of a mentality shift that happened. My colleagues, Thibaut Mora and, 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 uh, and Guillaume Lotois is in this, in this space with Level Up One, and the fund that is specialized in mobile gaming and so on. And I think due to the COVID, uh, it was easier, I think, globally to understand the educational potential and the, the, you know, the virtue, virtue of gaming to a certain extent. But what I'm very interested in also is to understand Gaming is one of the most data-centric and advanced uh, uh, sector of the creative industries when it comes to the, to the usage of data and data analytics and AI and so on. So is how to use this knowledge that's been built in Europe to transfer it to other industries, the film industry, the music industry, the museums, the immersive art and so on. And I think we have to break a bit these silos and to take the best of the sectors we got. We missed some opportunities, not, notably in music tech. Spotify, SoundCloud, all of these, they were the leaders in Europe. And still, so Spotify has made it, but we have to build upon that and to create, I mean, global leadership uh, based on, on these elements and embodying the European values and all of the, the centuries of investment that all of our countries have made in culture and, and, and leverage this 
into into value and values creation. No, absolutely, Vincent. I I really appreciate uh, this point that you're making. By the way, one of the really interesting aspects of gaming uh, in the crossover with the educational sector is the fact that it spontaneously generates an impact metric as 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 a real consequence of the activity itself. So, from this point of view, this of course creates one of the sectors in which we can experiment in terms of this. Uh, impact perspective in ways that are, let's say, in some sense, more, uh, more natural, more inbuilt than in other uh, cultural and creative sectors in which, uh, for example, the impact metrics uh, beyond the business, traditional business metrics are, of course, much more difficult to, to, to develop and controversial. But uh, from this point of view, uh, one, one of the aspects that I think um, are uh, notable in terms of uh, main cultural differences between uh, the Asian or the American world on one side and one in Europe, what is happening in Europe is this fact that, for example, especially in the US, there is a very, very strong focus on, again, the traditional business performance criteria, but very little concern in terms of uh, the social transformational impact, sometimes even neglect from this point of view. Uh, when we think of uh, this dimension of impact investing, especially in terms of uh, social impact investing, what do you think are the perspective from this point of view? Is there a detectable difference in terms of the European attitude and our capacity to, to interact uh, fruitfully with the social impact investing world or not? Vincent, what do you think? I think if I take the VC lens, uh, what matters is the is the metrics. Then, of course, the the underlying stories. You you will look at impact. You will look at, at all of these things. What I what I think is important is to put in light the the unfair advantages of Europe, because there are many in terms of culture. If you look at many sector of the of, of the cultural space, and we can use these assets that others don't have and find clever business model to leverage them and to create impact through this. But I think, I think we should find the, 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 the overlap between profitable, highly scalable business models, models and the unfair advantage of Europe uh, with projects that are, that are impact-based. Uh, um, I think it's really important. And, and creators are, for me, creativity is what defines us as humans, right? Uh, it's, um, you know, that's my point of view. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Vincent. And is there anybody else who wants to comment on this specific aspect, the relationship with social impact investing? Olivier? Yeah. May, may I? May Gering, I, uh, the, oh, yeah, exactly. yeah, Gering, 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 please, oh, please. I go, I go after you. Thank you. Uh, it's it's uh, um, now I now I understand your take on on this uh, social impact. I think uh, the, the Europe has a unique role. I mean, in, in because of our heritage, about our you know culture, and it uh, which is based on on solidarity and understanding. And you know, uh, the European Union is the most peaceful project in the last fifty years or seventy years, nearly now. I think seventy years. So uh, I think we have to give a lot uh, in that sense, and then uh, to. Uh, to 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 st uh, to stretch out this idea about digital humanism, you know, we have on the one side in America uh, a brutal capitalism, where I mean, when you refer to the metaverse, where we are only numbers, you know, where we exploited, where our work, you know, uh, our play work is basically exploited by huge corporations. We have on the other side China as an authoritarian uh, uh, new capitalist uh, uh, system uh, which which. Uh, uh, lives on limitations and, and not freedom of expression. And I think we have to show the third way in that sense. And, and this is really based on our traditions and our, our heritage, you know, enlightenment, so to say, uh, what, what, we, what we gathered, uh, what we gained and gathered over the years. And uh, I think this can be the unique role. And, and this is besides all the, uh, the, 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 uh, the money matrix and, and how to make money. And so it's really about the content and about what we can share and it's not only about uh, old buildings which are everywhere in Europe you know we can show but it's really what will be what we achieved over the years. Thank you thank you very much Gerin and Olivier. So uh, maybe talking about uh, I, I think building on what Vincent or Vincent maybe uh, ideas on we should work better on a, on a globe I, I interpret it as a, also a common glossary because we, we need to have this learning curve and this make sure uh, 
but but I think uh, we need to make an effort of using also frameworks which which speaks to everybody. So if you talk about the SDGs in the social impact investment uh, world, it's really used. But I have a couple of uh, so I'd say every, every everybody agrees on the need and uh, let's say the urgency to prioritize SDGs, right? Because basically it's a good instrument because it talks to the policymaker and eventually, which is not there yet uh, in our foundation, we work on that. It talks to citizens eventually, right? The problem is like it's all based on global indicators, right? So uh, I think uh, I think that the, given that the SDGs were only introduced in 2015, in, uh, I think we, we have a lack, a gap of analysis of the, impl of the implementation of projects which are uh, you know contributing to the SDGs. And also, like the, the problem is our, how our radar is being built. So there's a lot of initiatives which are absolutely not measurable under the perspective of a company or a, a, a public body. Because if you talk about rural projects, we have no support. They comply and they contribute uh, to many SDGs, but they're not on the map. And uh, basically, in our crowdfunding platform, we have these projects using the platform to make sure that uh, they, they, you know, they have an impact. So we can measure that. So it's, it's also the data is something we can offer. And I think we have a type of data, we have a model, probably VCs have all, another model, they have another matrix. Can we make it, have a conversation and use the same language for a moment, uh, even if it's a pilot? So if you would use the SDGs, my, uh, I'd say VC and social impact investment is very fragile. Because uh, the, the data I've got is in the first three months of the pandemic, you know, in, talking about SDGs, investors moved around like 90 billions of euros out of emerging markets. Uh, so that was the largest outflow ever recorded. So I think it's very fragile if we think social impact is based also on, uh, on something we can't measure, we can reach to. And, you know, the first crisis happening, we're out of it. You know, because it's too, it's too risky. So we need to ensure that uh, uh, public money, public policies, ensure that uh, we're building together an, an heritage for, for the next entrepreneurs and for the next uh, culture makers to, to come. So uh, be aware that even SDGs through the pandemic have, have changed completely. We should, we should re review how they're measured because the, the pandemic itself has been exaggerating some of the effects of the SDGs. So, so, uh, so on, gen on gender and violence, et cetera, many, many, many examples. Uh, so sorry to bother you with, uh, with social issues, but I think it's so important to look at them. Absolutely not. Thank you so much, Olivier. And uh, Fabio, do you want to add something on the social impact dimension or? I skipped the turn. I'm, I'm not. Okay. 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 No problem. But uh, at this point, uh, clearly, uh, the, the natural question that comes is uh, given this scenario that we have been uh, that we have been sketching out so far, what could be, from your point of view, the role of the public sector in facilitating these trends? What What is missing from the picture in terms of public sector action at all levels? Of course, from the European Commission level down to the regional level uh, according to your focus or interest or uh, relevance what do you think uh, is uh, is uh, needed in this regard if anything who wants to yeah. start yeah right. I, Vincent. Uh, I think i think i think we, move, we missed some opportunities in the in in terms of digital infrastructure in europe um, and i have the impression that this is needed in order to, to, to build world leaders. Uh, and I think the public sector should uh, work hand in hand with the private sector to ensure that Europe has this type of, of, uh, of digital infrastructures. Uh, I mean, my colleagues uh, on the VC funds I'm working on, they, you know, they financed uh, whatever that was the closest competitor to, to, to Netflix. They financed Dailymotion, that was the, the closest competitors to, to, you, to YouTube and so on. But we, we, we did not manage to go. I think we are too country centric, centric nation, nation centric. And I think that the public or Europe, at European level, we can, we can create a dynamic that puts the, the stake at the European and global level instead of a national level and make more fluidity in the way uh, the value is being created in Europe. I think that's one, one key thing for me and that should be a focus on, the, on, the, on this. If we want to master the, the second renaissance uh, uh, you know, uh, with creators in the centers uh, as we mastered in Europe the first renaissance. Thank you, thank you very much, much Vincent. And uh, at this point, uh, I'm really happy to welcome Josefina Age, who, who has uh, meanwhile uh, 
joined us. And uh, before uh, turning to the other panelists uh, on the role of the public uh, sector in this specific context, I would like to give the floor to Josephine because uh, she can give us a very, very interesting perspective on the dimension of community-based finance that of course is becoming extremely important in this context. And of course, uh, also what is the role of regional culture and creative industry associations in financing their work? And she, she's doing an impressive work in Creative Saxony. It is probably one of the most interesting, but also at the same time, you know, complicated regions in this moment in Europe uh, for, uh, for, for cultural, social, um, the reasons that we all we all understand. So, Josephine, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Pier Luigi, and uh, and and all the dear colleagues. Um, I brought uh, from my region a very practical insight into the revival of the fan club, as I called it, and then financing model in culture and creative sectors with a special focus on the individual creator. And so, this is really a, yeah, a, a very hands-on. Uh, um, view into some really practical examples. Uh, from the music industry, we know that business models in the music industry shifted dramatically and fundamentally in the last 20 years. And uh, a core problem of many creators is always, and you all know it, that conceptual work is very seldom paid. And it's especially true for a production in the music sector. So this is an example of a band that is based here in Leipzig, where I'm in my home office again now. And um, they uh, ha had become quite popular and, um, and but, but then uh, st stopped touring for a while and wanted to work on a new album. And uh, as with many um, entrepreneurs in the music business, Many, even even many professional musicians have second jobs, right? And so it's it's hard to to have a focus on the core artistic um, on the artistic work. So they asked their communities, their fan base. They already had a very established fan base, uh, even. Um, um, uh, in Australia, they went on an international world tour, also to Australia, and they asked their fan base, so can you give us money in order to finance the work on the new album? And um, so that's what the fan base basically did. They have um, uh, more than uh, 200 regular supporters on the on the platform Patreon. Um, you can imagine it, it's a model, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it basically works like crowdfunding, but on a constant basis. Yeah, so like if you have an, an ABO for a newspaper, but for your favorite artist or graphic designer or musician. Um, and uh, so they really financed more than two years work uh, of the of the creative head of the band, and so they could release their fourth album at, and then entered uh, the German uh, charts on uh, position forty five, um, and they raised more than two thousand euros uh, a month, which is uh, financing, so to say, the basic income um, for the creative head of the band. Another example I want to share with you is that uh, from the literature sector, this is a, a, an author and audio producer uh, based in my region and he has a nice quote from Kurt Tucholsky, a reader um, um, is in a good state, he can choose his favorite writer. That's uh, what the quote says in the picture. And um, th that's a bit the basic thinking also of all these community-based or fan-based finance. And um, he was uh, actually very insecure whether he should go the, down this path and ask, you know, ask for, for money by his fans. And he was he, he um, thought about it for two years. And now he gets also more than 2,000 euros a month from over 200 uh, supporters and he is financing uh, not only his um, yeah, his life a bit but also experimental artistic um, uh, yeah concepts that he would not uh, finance over the market. Um, a third example is uh, from an from an illustrator that is uh, you know uh, in this niche of um, of this special kind of graphic design. And she's uh, very successful, uh, very successful internationally, and um, she uh, even manages to finance an assistant now. So, uh, to summarize, um, we 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 do see a revival of the fan club, 
and uh, uh, through platforms like Patreon or Steady, you might know from where it's more about financing independent journalism. Um, uh, creators become independent of sometimes really complicated uh, public uh, investment uh, or funding schemes or also private investor logics. Um, um, however, I don't think it's for every creator because you have to work a lot on the community and it's also not for the uh, for beginners, so for those creators who start their careers, um, that's not a model that would work because the pre precondition is really that you have an established fan base and a community you can work and communicate with. Um, the, as a, the creators also have to think about a vast variety of rewards. So if um, if you give um, uh, annual uh, monthly money to a creator. Um, depending on the amount of money you get rewards like access to exclusive content or uh, some of them even send out books so it's a it's a huge variety and uh, the the income is not they is not treated in terms of taxes like a donation but it's treated like a normal business income and um, by the creators uh, from our network it's used for living expenses uh, as i said for experimental or non-commercial cultural projects for investments in their creative work and software etc and also for staff that's what i found uh, really interesting um, so that might, might be a, a short little uh, insight into uh, this perspective completely independent of private or public investment uh, in the sector, well, really community-based uh, finance. And um, the, the way our uh, associations, our creative industries uh, associations work is also uh, very bottom up, um, but of course we also cannot uh, live completely without uh, public funding. But do you maybe have some questions now on this uh, fan based aspect I just I just presented? Oh, thank you, thank you very much, Josephine. That's uh, really really interesting. Also because it shows that uh, clearly we are speaking about, uh, of course, the big numbers and the unicorns, but we also have uh, to remember that uh, there is a, an incredibly rich and diverse grassroots creative economy in uh, not only Europe, of course, uh, this is a global phenomenon. Uh, and uh, it's, it's important also to maintain this global focus in, in, in this concern. And especially the fact that uh, it's not really a matter of simply financing. I, I really like your, uh, your emphasis on the revival of the fan club idea, because uh, in, uh, in, in uh, fun activity in every sense, there is of course a very, very strong active participation dimension. We have to uh, remember that in some sense, uh, some of the disruption of the old model started, for example, from fan fiction, from forms in which people really participated to the narrative that was created. And I think that uh, especially for creators today, this kind of direct contact is not simply giving some uh, financial support, but sometimes is even giving motivation, inspiration, uh, social contact, which is uh, so important. W what do you think, Josephine? I think that uh, it's, it's much beyond the instrumental dimension, right? Yes, definitely. And um, I also would like to point out that it has been especially um, important also during the COVID crisis because um, um, the the platform is not it's it's not, it's not it's not like a technical platform to which you can make payments, right? Um, but it's an uh, uh, it's a communication instrument, a motivation instrument. And I mean, in in, in, in our network, there's a um, yeah, huge flow of depression now going on and frustration and um, this kind of direct interaction with the fans. I mean, it's not for everyone, yeah, for very shy creators or who, you know, who are, who you also have to accept that you are as a per, not only as a creator with your artistic content, but also as a person, you are very public and you have, you know, you are very transparent in a way. And this is surely not uh, for everyone, but it definitely has a strong, um, yeah, motivation and encouragement dimension as well. Very uh, important psychological dimension. I agree, completely agree. Well, thank you, thank you, Josephine. And by the way, Vansan was making some very interesting remarks on our on our chat. Vansan, do you want to comment uh, open floor on this on, on, on the yeah. role of Patreon in this regard? Yeah, I, th I think Patreon is a good example because it's a unicorn in itself. It's uh, valued uh, 
over 400 billion and it, it gives more than 100 billion dollars to creatives uh, uh, each year so i think there is the there is the, the two sides of of things that creating this digital infrastructure to power also social and and, and impact uh, uh, initiative is really important i think it's about creation tools management tools content distribution that we can see this type of 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 uh, of value creation along the chain. I think and it's, and it's, for the creatives, it's a strong um, learning curve, I would say. We, we made an, like a, a, a panel round during the first uh, COVID wave. Uh, we invited uh, three creators, um, the, the one I mentioned, uh, to, to a panel discussion. Um, and um, I mean, also, the, if we talk about investment in creative industries, you know, it's not possible without those who make the content, right? Without this, all these uh, manifold, uh, hundred thousands of solo entrepreneurs creating the content for the then more technical platforms, right? If I, if I may on this, I, th I think there is uh, on the side of creators always this impression that they are the, you know, the, the one that are not considered financially and it's rooted in 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 a, in a reality somehow and i think to liberate this into more fair uh you know uh, models uh goes with creativity also in the way they are financed themselves um, and what, you find what, also nfts all, all type of new types of financing uh, art and and so on on the case of nfts i'm less you know less enthusiastic because you need to find like an lc uh, relation between the primary market and the secondary market where things are getting exchanged but yet you have new, new systems emerging from, from, from this. I think in the, in the past, you had very strong gatekeepers, like in the music, for example, the, the majors. Then it kind of fragmented itself and it allowed uh, the creators to go B2C and to have tools and platforms to go B2C. That's the same value creation that happens in gaming that is, that is happening to, to the music sector, the, the film sector, not quite yet, but it's being really disruptive and challenged now. So there's a lot of reflection to have around this to power the creatives as units and little business uh, units themselves. Maybe before Garen and, and, and Barbara Stacher, um, it's not, we have to invest a lot in capacity building for, for this. We are working with the art schools in the region and these kind of financing models are not, I mean, are not taught at all. I mean, it's not part of the, I mean, artistic education, Not it's not anyway, but even in the career centers, they don't have it. Um, on their map, so to say, yeah. So they, they they teach about so how can you set up an exhibition, and they do a bit now on digital, but in terms of capacity building, there is um, to make people aware and also to um, to, to yeah to to, um, to make peer learning among creatives happen on how you can put yourself uh, onto a platform like this, not only in technical terms, but really also in terms of how do I communicate with my community. Um, is really an issue for us as uh, creative industry supporters. So at uh, this point, I will give the floor to Barbara first and then to Gary. Barbara. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm just wondering how, you know, the interplays for me are quite interesting. For example, I'm also funding a few musicians on Patreon. How did I arrive at Patreon? Through YouTube, actually, <laughs> because, uh, you know, YouTube then says, the, the musician then says, okay, why don't you fund us on Patreon? you know, in his video. And that's how I think it's quite interesting, actually, how then you can even through a big platform, uh, then arrive at Patreon. I'm just wondering, also with what Vincent said, now, if Patreon is valued over $4 billion, and $1 billion goes to the creative, so where does the rest go? I mean, <laughs> you know, does it go to Patreon's pocket or to YouTube or intermediaries? Or what happens with the rest? I mean, the, the one billion is what they, they distribute per year, and the valuation of the company is, is the, the assessment of what Patreon is worth in the long term. So it is not that there, there are three billion remaining, so to speak. So that's the first remark, I, I, I would say. And I think the, you know, Europe versus the US, for example, YouTube and Patreon are US based, yeah? Yeah, so exactly. So my, my question then is to you, Vincent. I mean, what's the business model? How does it look like? I mean, you know, how much of what these platforms, even if they are intermediaries, how much it, what they make is distributed to the actual musician and how much gets somewhere else? I mean, hmm. anybody has some insight about it? 
maybe very shortly, you have two examples of that. I would take Ableton, that is uh, like na with Native Instrument, a music tech company in Berlin. And I would take uh, Belief, Di Belief Digital, that became Belief. Uh, this is a distribution company for, for music. The first one, Ableton, VCs wants to, big money wants to, to finance it and to bring it public, but the owners say, no, we don't want to. You know, it's, it's kind of, so it's a way you can keep the full control on, on what you are doing and you don't need to go into speculative models. Believe Digital became a unicorn from Europe and with digital platforms and data and insight allowed these this, uh, single musicians and creators to have better control, to make better marketing and to make more money for themselves. And they became, uh, they became a unicorn and empowered a lot of hundreds of thousands of, of, of creators, becoming one of the largest structure for music in the world. Uh, maybe the fifth, fifth ones in terms of size. So I think you can, you have, it's a competitive uh, question at the end. They are business rooted in good values. And then you have to have something competitive that, that works against the, the competitors in the US right? or, or, or in, in Asia or in other places. Gary. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, I mean, uh, because the discussion was going to, to NFT, I want to make a short remark on NFTs. I, I would like to warn, you know, that the, the next type, the NFTs and blockchain is the solution to everything. I mean, uh, we know that the, that the arts market, uh, weapons, pornography uh, are, the, are the markets which are not regulated. And basically the, the, the creators get the, the least out of that. You know, it's the, the galleries and, and the, the middlemen get the most out of it. So NFTs, NFTs, I mean, we will, show, we will see in the future what does it mean for, for creatives, but this is not, it will be not the solution for our problem. It's only, you know, a, a market instrument, but not, not really how we can pay creatives for their work. And that's why I like uh, Josefina's um, uh, example very much. So this is a social approach, so to say, to how we can support our creators. And uh, I want to give an exp uh, explanation or, or for my experience. Experience. I mean, I had also my, my little share in, in unicorns in the year 2000, and we founded a company in 1996, uh, uh, 1996, and uh, grow grow a little bit, little bit, little bit. And there we had a very inter interesting instrument from the from the city government. It was called mezzanine uh, financing. So it meant that you are as a company, you are too small to 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 dis disappear, but you. Uh, too small to grow, you know. So you're just in the middle, as as Vincent uh, Vincent uh, argued. You know, we 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 invest a lot in the beginning and something on the end, but in the middle we leave the creatives out. And this mezzanine financing instrument was really really interesting because it uh, the 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 public uh, body, you know, took share, took an equity share in our company, uh, not in the strategic way, but in the uh, control and financing way. Unfortunately, two. 2005, this was uh, uh, this was uh, cancelled. Uh, this instrument because of the Basel II uh, financing framework, and uh, so so I was told it, it's not possible anymore to that the public you know take a share in a company without you know really owning the company so to say. So I think we we should develop such an instrument you know where we can help these small entrepreneurs to scale up to a certain size when then they can go to the to the to the next step on, on the food chain as Vincent uh, explained it very much so I, I really uh, pledge for such thing you know we have the one hand we have the the models for Josephine or the crowdfunding we have uh, fools and friends so to say and and we need something in the middle I think in, in Germany, they just introduced such an instrument in the, in, in the course of the COVID recovery. They, we, we had a, um, like, like a, where the state became a shareholder also in small and medium sized companies. I have to yeah, look it up, but uh, because yeah, but I think that, for some of our agencies it, it worked. I think it's interesting because it's in a crisis that the government in a specific country does that. What I wish for in, in, at the European level is you have these AIC programs and the, the blended financing that, that allows to have like 10, you know, 5, 10 million to really grow company to the next stage. Uh, if we have some, some types of co-financing scheme globally for this pre-series A, seed pre-series A and series A phase, it will, it will really allow to have company 
uh, like going a few lat uh, higher and, 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 and grow towards a, a significant company. I'm convinced of that on, on the European level. Of course, national, on national level and regional level, there should be also some schemes. But yeah, we have the Creative Europe uh, Guarantee Facility. Uh, are you anybody is using that one? Germany it's, did not introduce it. No. Huh? It's basically for the banks. So uh, I mean, if if a creative want a bank loan and he doesn't have the, the you know uh, the possibility to take it, it, as a normal bank loan, the bank can give a loan and if the creative fails to pay back because I don't know the game doesn't work or whatever, then the, then the Commission, the European Investment Fund, uh, recompenses the bank for its loss. Mm -hmm. I mean, up to ninety percent. Or I, so, I, I I use this scheme for the, the film industry, for example, and that's the type of of of, uh, of schemes that 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 are very useful, I believe. But okay. I think I think also the, the EIT to have kick specialized, just to have the sector considered as one of the priority sector from Europe, and to have uh, not 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 you know more money not than other sectors, but just the same level of priority and proper money to invest in the infrastructure and grow the full ecosystem. For me, it's the, the, the first thing and it's being done now. So I'm super happy about that. By the way, one passing thought about uh, the, 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 the NFT um, issue that uh, was raised several times. I think that one of the most curious things about uh, this situation is that we are creating artificial, uh, uh, let's say, an artificial way of creating a scarcity and, and let's say intellectual property in a situation in which we have a technology that works exactly in the opposite direction. Because the really interesting uh, dimension of, uh, of course, the digital platform is that they are uh, deploying a massive forms of collective intelligence and co-creation. And we are creating an artificial scarcity simply as a, let's say, as a tactic to create uh, some rent of position, so to speak, from this point of view. This is clearly going against the tide and it's difficult that it will remain sustainable in the long term. At the same time, however, it's interesting to see what kind of nervous wreck this has created, for example, in fields like the art market, uh, turning the completely the tables in a few months time. And this is really something that probably will become a case study for the future in a, in a, in a very, very interesting way. But before our times runs out, I would really like to, to, to switch back to one point that we need to have uh, some more uh, input about, which is uh, what is the role of the public sector in facilitating what is happening? Do we have uh, something missing from the picture? Olivier, what do you think? Uh, I think I've told about that in, in, a, in a, um, responding to the first uh, two questions. I think match funding, as we call it, is the most uh, democratic funding we can find. Uh, so right now it's mostly applied to uh, rewards-based crowdfunding. So uh, in our experience, after 25 uh, developing 25 schemes on the regional, uh, city scale, national scale, European scale with different uh, entities, private and public, um, I think we still we 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 need to work on the other side, which is basically how the policy making allows that type of funding. So I was mentioning a couple of, uh, of references. Uh, I don't know if you know about that, I will be sharing it. Uh, the fee compass program of the European Commission as, as uh, just released a, uh, a few times ago, um, a report on crowdfunding and ECF, so social, fin social uh, financing combination. I think it's an interesting uh, thing to, to mention. And I'd also, also to mention that we need to create a culture for the public entities to reproduce, right? So we have to create our own autonomy in creating these tools. Uh, and that's basically that's what we did nationally with match funding. Uh, you shouldn't say that, but most of the time we, need, we needed to do the policy making the technical work of how these match funding schemes need to be developed and be legally accepted by technicians inside the administration. So we have the capacity as the people who are around this table, I think, of creating uh, you know, scheme, new schemes for policy making. Uh, and if, if necessary, we'll, we'll also have our own lawyers to create that. But I think we need to create these models. I will give an, a very small example, which is growing a lot, talking, coming back to the COVID situation. During the COVID, uh, with uh, 20, 26 other uh, Catalan social and society economy organizations, cooperatives, NGOs, we have created this cooperative contingency fund to support initiatives uh, that were coordinating a, res a clear response to uh, the social and health emergency, right? Uh, and I think it, it was a big success. And what has happened is it's attracted the attention of the City Council of Barcelona, who is now we're working on a second phase where we'll have a triple combination of, of hybrid funding, which is basically we have the citizens doing uh, donation funding. Um, on one side, then we'll have the uh, public body multiplying by two 
uh, also as a, as a re on a reward base. Then, then we have a series of cooperatives of credits, which is a specific figure in the Catalan uh, social and solidarity economy, which are you know, uh, also multiplying it by two on the scheme of crowd equity, right? So I think it's inter also interesting of uh, how much we can combine these models uh, which talk to specific actors of this uh, uh, cosmology, we need to make sure that we share the same values. So rather you're a policymaker, a citizen or a creator. So, and again, I'm insisting that this type of scheme should be, uh, we have said that should be uh, developed within, uh, uh, you know, capacity building programs. And we have enough data to know about what that is the needs of this project, just by analyzing the data of, of platforms, for example. And I'd like also to come back to the idea of scaling I know Vincent is, is on the other side of the scales, on the, on the, on the scale, uh, but I think we need to create that culture of, can we create, a, you, know, you know about these movements of platform cooperatives? So I think the next unicode should be a cooperative and that, that, that will run, you know, we'll have new policies, we have new, and, and I'd like to see that the beauty of small scale, right? If you talk to, and I have this analogic example, if you know about the, you know, the, these famous album, which is, uh, you know, of the Velvet Underground with the Wowl design, it sold only a thousand records at that time. So think about fan based. But most importantly, all of the, the people who had bought this record have created a band, which is the channel, of, you know, that's the value of it. Plus all the bands who have been creating, up, and then it's a success, it seems to be a success, but at the time, it was just creating a new culture. So I can, you know, I think the fan based idea that was brought today is also a fact that it should not never stay a fan base. It should make sure that you're also creating your band by supporting me. This is the type of, of culture I wanna share. Uh, absolutely, Olivier. That's that's a fantastic perspective, and uh, I, I, I'm totally for it because I think that that's exactly the logic of uh, active uh, participation, and it's really co-agency in the in, in the real and substantial sense of the word. And uh, Fabio, do you have uh, any thoughts on uh, the, the, what is missing from the point of view of the public support, public action? Yeah, I think it should be start since the primary school. I mean, if we are moving towards a creative or creator based economy, we have to sustain the creative and the creative is something you can learn, but you can do something in the first years of life and schools should change completely their paradigm. Uh, I dream a school where they teach ancient Greek and robotics at the same time, and even public funding where um, a farmer and philosopher and nuclear engineer comes together and creates something. I mean, as commissioner here in Italy for some public funding, I, I, I found the worst project when they come from three archaeologists or two musicians together. Instead, the best always the best are from people from completely different backgrounds. But right now, even at universities, we are going towards verticals. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we, are, we should avoid to, to dig deeper inside the topic, but we should facilitate this kind. And last but not least, we should decompartmentalize the cultural structures. Because if we live still in a world where we have museum, public libraries, theaters, I don't know, uh, statues and stuff like that, people are, are thinking in that way. So that's our, and last but not least, we should liberalize the access to, uh, uh, the creative access to the contents. Uh, I mean, when I want to use something, for example, um, a video in the Rai archives, I have to pay 1,500 euro for each minute in my video games. But at that point, we are not winning both. I'm losing because I can't use that content. At the same time, the public entity Rai are seeing their archives dying because nobody are reusing that and no, no new economies have been generated starting by what we have heredited from the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Very, very good points. And uh, Josephine, what, what do you think is missing from the public action? Your perspective from this point of view is particularly, of course, useful and insightful. And I know I know it might sound like a like a never um, like um, 
yeah, like a CD maybe that is uh, ongoing, but I, I still don't see that we have sufficient instruments for non-technological innovation, for like really content innovation. Uh, I think um, as well on the regional level, as well, um, as, well as on the national level, um, this is still, I mean, there has now progress been made with the New Horizon Europe program, um, but I think we have a lot of homework still to do in terms of really supporting content innovation beyond the beyond the a narrower uh, uh, media sector um what uh, what strikes me also from a regional perspective is that um there is um you know apart from the urban uh, areas where we have a you know really good density of creators and uh, and networks and and also bigger companies in the creative sector um, is the investment in the rural uh, in, in rural areas. We are now working with our leader regional managements um, to so, so leader for the international uh, listeners is a, is a um, European funding scheme for regional development. Um, and we are now working with them to create non-investment uh, funding opportunities for the cultural and creative sector, because this is not natural. Leader was mostly used for building bike lanes and kindergartens and uh, solar panels on, on, city, um, on, on city roofs. Um, but we are now uh, going into no negotiations with them and uh, raise awareness for non-investment funding in the region into culture, creative tourism, creative uh, hubs, uh, um, uh, festivals, etc. And uh, I think the questions we raised today also puts a big question mark on the established uh, cultural policy. So I, I really think we, see, we, we need more um, yeah, interference, interaction, uh, and cooperation with the, between the established uh, state institutions and, uh, the, and the free cultural scene, the, the independent cultural scene. There have been uh, many interesting pilots in the last years, and this is definitely a way to go, because I think that also the, 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 the state-funded cultural institutions have a responsibility to shape um, the creative, uh, the, the next generation of creatives and support them as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Josephine. And by the way, your, your emphasis on the rural dimension, of course, couldn't be more timely and relevant at the moment. I think that even in the, for example, the new perspective on the kick, we, we see probably for the first time a perspective that today also has to do with uh, social inclusion and, uh, and more generally with uh, cohesion. Whereas, for example, the philosophy for the kicks so far has been a technological acceleration, but without a real, real interest in these dimensions of social cohesion. So it's uh, probably culture is the laboratory to bring uh, radical innovation also into a more direct contact with local communities also outside of the big, uh, the big uh, metropolitan areas. At the same time, it's also very interesting what you emphasize about the specific role of uh, what we could call uh, basic research and R&D in the culture and creative field. Because of course, there is uh, one part that has to do with, in the, with the industrial logic, but there is also another part that is uh, very much related to these forms, again, of grassroots creativity that sometimes are the basis for the really new ideas when they scale up then in the industrial field. And I should say that, for example, it was very interesting to participate recently in an initiative by the Basque government that was entirely focused on this idea, answering to the question, what is innovation in the cultural field? What is R&D in the cultural field? What are the specific dimensions? I think we need more um, systematic thought from this point of view, because uh, it's, it's, it's a very subtle issue. And it's not just an academic issue. It's an issue on which it really depends uh, our own understanding of how to design new policies to facilitate uh, opportunities in this regard. But now I think that since time is running, I think we should also give some space to the Q and A from the from from the audience. And I saw in the in in the chat that there was an intervention by Severi Janus from Poland. He, he wanted to give. Uh, some uh, information about this uh, EU uh, forum uh, on the on the um, patronage, uh, sponsorship and patronage of culture, a, a, a point of view of the Polish experience in this regard. If uh, Sever is still listening, I think it would be interesting to give us uh, 
interesting to receive from him some some information about this. Uh, Sever, are you online? I, I don't know if he can be invited to speak uh, or um, but it doesn't seem to be. Okay, so if there are any more questions from the audience, uh, please uh, just to use the Q&A Q channel so that we can pick them. Um, okay, oh, there is Barbara. Oh, Barbara, yes, please. Uh, if you want, you can share, you can <laughs> no, share no, this. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt. I just, uh, while people were speaking, I was trying to find kind of uh, what is happening at the EU level because it's not always that easy to grasp. So, grasp. so when Olivier was talking about how to bring uh, public investors together with private investors, I posted a kind of um, of, in, of the Invest in EU program. Uh, you know, th there is a, I don't know if you have seen it, there is the Invest EU portal. So you can actually look for investors and match uh, funding and everything there. And uh, when Josephine was speaking about the need to, to um, have a more uh, inclusive approach to innovation and non-tech, uh, yes, she rightly mentioned the new Horizon Europe program, and I just pasted in the, you know, the current work program has lots of interesting topics ranging from fascism to games and culture shaping our society. So, I mean, there is quite a wealth of interesting calls this year. Next year, there will be other ones coming up, similar topics. So I think there is a lot to, you know, to, to, there's a lot out there, which maybe not, not everybody knows about it. And that's somehow a pity, yes. So it's good that we have today's conversation. Yeah, and uh, no, Barbara, I, 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 I really agree on this because it's even from a global perspective, if we do not only consider Europe, it's bewildering that in Europe, we have these possibilities for public financing and research on these very uncommon topics, uh, because uh, really, really the, the, the breadth and the, and the variety of the various calls that are being issued on, on culture in this, uh, in this round uh, of the Horizon Europe program is impressive. I think that this could really lay the basis for uh, bring Europe again uh, as an innovation leader in terms of transformational applied research in this field, because of course that's the, that's the issue. It's not just simply doing interesting research, it's, uh, it's really building actionable models of uh, transformation and intervention. And I think that, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm uh, very curious to see what's going uh, on uh, with the next round because this one was really, I mean, even myself, I was surprised because generally it's difficult to find uh, such a breadth and variety of possibility. But there was, uh, there was yes, uh, Josephine, you, you were also commenting on, uh, on an interesting initiative. Yeah. Uh, um, of the Investor but... Labs. Yeah, I, I will. I will post a, a li link to everybody. My my Berlin colleague from uh, Creative City Berlin. She, uh, for a couple of years, she's now hosting an investors lab for the cultural and creative sector, which might be an interesting format for the audience as well. I will. I will make the uh, the link public to the to the audience. Very good. So at this point, since we are drawing to a close, I would like to every of our panelists uh, if they have uh, some final. Uh, short thoughts in some sense to wrap up the discussion from their point of view. Is there anything that we have not uh, covered that we should have, or uh, let's say there is, a, is there any final message that you would like to deliver to our audience? I'll start with Gary. Boy, that was quick. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, thank you for the invitation and, and for the possibility to, to, to show and to discuss. I think what, what still, what, what I take from, from today's session is, uh, that we have to focus more on the gaming sector, that the gaming uh, sector and the relation to the public sector is, is pretty much underdeveloped or unappreciated. Un, uh, un, uh, so we have to force somehow the public sector to understand what, what it means to, to, to develop games and to, to, to develop uh, creative ideas with gaming. And the second one is, I think this is what we talked about, this, this uh, financing gap between very low financing or ent entering financing stages and the high financing. I think this is, this is something we have to work on and we have to come up with, with interesting solutions for that. And of course, the COVID uh, made it possible suddenly that the state takes more responsibility, but uh, even beyond the COVID uh, crisis, I think we have to see that there is a need, you know, to guide creatives through the whole process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. And uh, Vansa, 
Uh, I, I'd like also to suggest something for your final thoughts. How can we help grow the infrastructure ecosystem more, uh, more proactively in this regard? What's your, what's your final thought on this, Vincent? Yes. So, uh, you know, I'm dreaming a bit of a creative tech alliance in Europe where we can exchange between Helsinki, Oslo, uh, Germany, I mean, Berlin, all of the kind of creative centers, uh, uh, Barcelona and, and, and whatnot. Um, so this, this would be one thought. I think it's important that the leaders, also the, the, the CEOs of the companies, the creatives, the, the, the key people of the ecosystem can meet and, and, and exchange. Uh, I think there is both spectrum, right? The, almost all of the creative economy is made out of very little units, it's very little companies, yet they can create a grow, uh, value that is enormous. So it's to take these two, two elements into account. So infrastructure and uh, also the little units uh, uh, and also the content financing and the creative tech financing is not the same scheme. So to have the, the, two, the two things parallelly and to have also from the public side experts from the field to nurture the, 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 the decisions because it's very fragmented the sector, the creative tech, and uh, it, it needs, I think, expertise uh, to make the right decisions in developing the, the scheme. So I think this, this is what I see. And also to take into account that the creative industries also create values in larger markets, so to not to neg neglect the intersection between the creative industries and much larger markets, which all together creates massive value for, for, for Europe and, and for Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, Fabio, what's your take? Um, I just agree with the idea to use video game as lens to better understand the future changes in technologies, in the behavioral of younger generations, in creative, in new business model, because it's easier to, to, pivot, to pivot something in a virtual environment. And it can be really a social space where to, to experience new, new things to deploy all over other kind of markets. Absolutely no. Thank you. And uh, Olivier? Uh, just building on, on what Fabio was just mentioning, I think it's so important that uh, uh, we need to create a new culture before creating any infrastructure because, you know, most of the time people working in our sector of, uh, let's call it democratic you know, or social innovation, uh, sometimes, as I was mentioning before, we need to give the example to public bodies, but probably we go too fast for citizens. <laughs> so we need to be conscious about that. So I'd love, I'd love to see the, uh, you know, the, some of the game, uh, educational game tools we have talked uh, today, uh, to be able to fight, to do fact checking, uh, to fight political polarization, fake news. You know, I'd love to see that. So, you know, it's not an industry we need. We need a conscious industry about, uh, you know, all the derivation of society. And I think culture is a, is a key role. So we need new, new cultural formats. We need, we need cultural actors that, that are creating kind of a culture of uh, democracy and dialogue between citizens. So we need cohesion and, you know, and we need policy for that. We need tools and we need a new culture. And sometimes we need impact investment. <laughs> <laughs> and Josephine? Maybe only two points. So many has been said already. Um, so so a, a challenge remains on how we, you know, bring investments uh, also for the um, for the social impact of uh, the cultural and creative sector. And uh, um, from my perspective, I mean, I'm very closely following what, what Garen is also doing in, in, in Austria. So every every measure that increases demand for creative services is a good investment as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josephine. And so we are really closing now. And uh, I should say that today has been an extremely fruitful uh, day also for the preparation of the report that we are uh, working on in this moment at the OECD for the Commission and uh, the insights that arrived for, uh, from today's uh, sessions was, were really amazing. And uh, I'm not just saying this out of compliment. That's simply a description of what happened. Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's impossible to wrap up all, all we heard uh, in, during this afternoon session. I could say that uh, one aspect that emerged very clearly is that uh, the culture and creative uh, sector, it's not just another production sector. We, we can really take for granted the fact that today we have uh, a very, very interesting uh, uh, intertwined uh, uh, structure of uh, social change 
industrial technological change, cultural change, all, uh, all uh, interacting in ways that probably are difficult to find in other sectors. I'm not saying that culture has the monopoly of this, but probably what we are observing in the cultural field is today sometimes also anticipating in some sense the culturalization of other sectors as it is happening today. So from this point of view in particular, I think that um, there is, the, Part of this in increasing interest that, for example, Balsam was, uh, was mentioning in terms of uh, this uh, really, really uh, growing focus on, on, on the future strategic relevance of these sectors is probably an acknowledgement from society that uh, things are changing in this regard, that culture finally is getting out of this uh, sort of conceptual ghetto that has to do with a very, very limited idea of entertainment or style entertainment. I think that uh, it's really very much clear now that it's about the social transformation and social change, also through the production of culture and creative content. And so uh, as a consequence of this, the financing of activities is clearly related to this new logic that is not simply a logic, let's say, of grant making or logic of uh, subsidies to a married sector, se sector that produces married goods or simply a promising uh, sector in terms of potential economic impact, we are speaking about something very different. Not, uh, I mean, uh, dis disconnected from that, but very different because we are probably speaking of one of the most uh, powerful platforms of transformation of social change and behavior for the future as the very example of the new European Bauhaus is there to tell us. So at this point, I think we can really wrap up and I can uh, give back the floor to Katia for the final thoughts. Yeah, sorry, just to, to say oh, something before Barbara, wrapping sorry. up completely. No, uh, actually, uh, yes, talking about the need for a European Gaming Association, there is one. It's called ISFE. I posted it in the link. It's a European Gaming uh, Association. So I think, as with many other topics that we discussed today, uh, we don't have to reinvent the re wheel. Most of the things are there already. Actually, almost all of them are there already. It's just a way to find a way how to contact them, how to make them work for you, with you. Maybe they are also waiting for an interaction. I mean, all these different tools are waiting there to be used and so are the associations. And many of them are EU funded anyway. So, you know, feel free just to use all the instruments that are there. And maybe we should do this kind of things uh, very more often, uh, Pierre Luigi. I mean, that was highly interesting from many angles uh, and really not a boring session at all. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. I think that uh, it's also a sign of the fact that we are probably touching on the right issues at the moment. Very good. So, Katia, back to you for the closing. Uh, yes, no, it, it was good to hear from Barbara that we should do this more often because I, I was um, about to say that, well, it's the final webinar in the series of uh, almost two years of webinars. But uh, indeed, let's think about uh, uh, doing these conversations again and thinking about what these conversations should be. And I, 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 I really want to thank the speakers of this morning session, but also this afternoon for a particularly rich discussion and insights. Um, and indeed, we'll, uh, it will be extremely useful for us uh, also for the finalization of this report that we are doing on culture and creative sectors in OECD countries. And I think um, it's a good start for the next conversations and I would really uh, love to stay connected with the speakers around the table to also see your views on, on, on when we think about how to shape the OECD work on, on these issues going forward. So let, let's uh, stay connected. Um, and a big thank you also to the participants. And I guess that's, as it's uh, 16th of December, well, season's greetings to all and uh, stay safe. Um, enjoy the holidays. And well, let's look for a brighter and happier uh, 2022. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, fantastic session. Fantastic. Absolutely.